My name is Johanna Addison, and I'm an interpreter here at the Spark Private School. And I'm Oriana, and today we'll be giving a tour of the Homestead House. The main part of this home was built in 1823, with an addition of two wings on either side just three years later in 1826. Dr. John Simpson Bratton, one of the sons of William Bratton, who lived just down the road, and his wife Harriet built this structure, which was a grand upgrade from his father's home, which was built earlier on in the 18th century. This home, if you come through it, it may look uh, rather simple, however, for this period, it was quite the grand house with many rooms. Welcome to the assembly hall. This is an addition added on to the house sometime in the 1830s and was used for dining both on formal occasions and more than likely on a daily basis as well. The enslaved people who worked in the Bratton's home would have been servants to guests and the Bratton's family. They would have set up the table and brought food and drink from the kitchen to the assembly hall. In the 1850s, this room through here would have been used more than likely actually as a nursery. During this time, there weren't nearly as many children going in and out of this house. The grandmother, Mrs. Harriet, uh, would have actually kept her granddaughter, Harriet the Third, probably in this room with an African American wet nurse. Now, what's really interesting about wet nurses in this era is that they would have really taken care of the child. Of course, her grandmother would have overseen this taking care of. However, the child, as well as the enslaved woman, would have lived in this room. During both the 1840s and the 1850s, this room would have been bustling with the enslaved people here on the Brighton Plantation. This room would have most likely been a butler's pantry, where food could be prepared and finalized before it was taken into the parlors, which are accessed through a door just through here. This room in the main part of the house would have functioned as a family parlor for the Brattons. This is part of the 1823 original home, while the formal parlor was just attached to it three years later in 1826. These rooms would have functioned similar to what your living room functions to. Now in the 1840s and 50s, the Brattons would have gathered here to talk about trips, all sorts of daily happenings. But when formal occasions occurred, or perhaps notable guests, they would entertain them in the more formal parlor. In the parlors, enslaved African Americans would have served the Bretons and their guests with foods and drinks, and they also would have kept these areas clean. The Bratton family and their many children would have slept in the upstairs rooms. Enslaved people would have been in charge of making the beds, emptying the chamber pots, and cleaning. Based upon paint analysis and other evidence, this room specifically would have been used for the daughters. This room on the opposite end of the hallway would have been used as the boys' room. For both of these rooms, enslaved people would have their hands full, cleaning and keeping up with all the children in this home. The Brattons had 14 children, although not all of them were home at the same time, and they may well have had boarders from the female academy just down the street. While this house showed the wealth of the Brighton family, the lifestyle they enjoyed here was dependent on the work of the enslaved. Today we're going to be talking about the skilled and slayed people here at Historic Brattonsville. Now we know that on this plantation we had 139 individuals and they were probably mostly farmhands, but there was a few of them that were skilled laborers. They were actually... 
Here at this location, we know there was a gentleman by the name of Adam. Uh, he, the Brattons themselves put his value at $1,000. The reason why that high value was assigned to him was because of he was a blacksmith. He was in high demand. Especially on a farm, you're going to have to have uh, tools that you use every day. Now, those tools would have been made by the blacksmith. Especially in this area, most of the blacksmiths were making uh, smaller hand tools, much like this uh, meat fork. Um, what we also know, of course, is reaping hooks. You know, they take a piece of flat metal and they bend it over make a sharp edge uh, also some of the things were things like horseshoes uh, what we know of course is like gardening tools these are a few examples of uh, handmade gardening tools that they would have used another uh, probably the most important thing they would have probably been making here on the plantation believe it or not was this little thing called a nail now if you ever seen the older homes they have cedar shank shingles uh, that required a ton of nails thousands of nails for each house so one blacksmith may have been out here for weeks just making enough nails uh, to be able to roof a house. And let's talk about the blacksmith forge itself. Now, in order to forge metal, you have to get it hot. Uh, much like we may know Play-Doh, how we can mold it. Well, you got to get that temperature up on that steel, anywhere from 12 to 2,000 degrees. Now, the way they would have done it is uh, they would have used coal. This is a, our forge here. This is a double bellow forge. So you got your bellow here, which pumps air into uh, this area here. Now, what we'd use, we use coal. Now, we know coal doesn't burn 1,200 to 2,000 degrees, but by adding air into that, that creates more air volume and in turn creates a hotter temperature. And you can see now, of course, my coals are getting hotter and hotter, and we leave that metal in that coal until we see it turn almost like an orange color. Well, we got this metal, um, got it in a hotter temperature. And what we're going to do is use our anvil and our hammer. And at this point, what we're doing is we're just drawing that metal out. Think about, like I said, with Play-Doh, how you draw that, that Play-Doh out. That's exactly what we're doing here. And we're able to hammer it until it gets cool again. You notice it's not glowing anymore. And then we have to put it back in. Now, that lets you know how long it takes to forge something. And that's where my respect for Adam is. Um, is the fact of he had to do this every day um all during the week in these hot conditions we know in south carolina you know this, it's not uncommon for it to get 95 degrees but well, you can imagine 95 degrees you got to wear uh full clothing because you don't want to get burned and you're out here pumping this bellow non-stop you have the heat coming off these coals and then you're taking a hammer and beating it on a, on an anvil so uh, that gives you kind of an idea about you know just how hard of a job that was Hello, my name is Lucas Hamby here at Historic Brownsville, and right now we're set up in what looks like a tailor shop or a seamstress's shop. But seeing as it's all mainly men's garments, it's going to be referred to the first name as a tailor shop. Now here at Brightonsville, we know a little bit about Adam, one of the enslaved blacksmiths here on the property, but we know even less of basically nothing about the enslaved tailors or seamstresses on site. The only evidence we do have about seamstresses or tailors is a needle and a thimble found under one of the buildings or an archeological dig. Now that doesn't say much because you find those at almost every single settlement, enslaved or not enslaved across the world. It's the most commonly found archeological artifacts. But with that being said, you can make a safe assumption that there would at least be possibly one seamstress and maybe even a tailor at this site based when you look at a few other documents such as John Hammond's plantation manual. He states that men are supposed to be given or make their own trousers and shirts while women are supposed to be able to make their own dresses. Now that said, we don't actually know if it occurred here, but we can make an assumption that it may have occurred here or in this area itself. Now the skill of tailoring itself, you're going to have a lot of little things you need to know how to make. You need to know how to make buttons. You need to know how to construct coats and put them together, make collars, use interfacing. So it's a very skilled trait. And with that skill trait, you need to focus on mainly how to get something to fit to the body of somebody, which is a very a particular science in itself. You need to know how someone's built, how their curves are, how their flat portions are. 
You didn't know how to align your seams on your garment so they actually sort of contour the body, make it fit properly and not just like a sack. Although for the enslaved personnel here, if you're making the clothing for themselves, they don't have a lot of time to do that. They don't have the time to get in those fancy silks and all those nice fabrics. They're mainly working with rough jean wool or cotton. So all their garments are gonna sort of be lackluster compared to anybody else. Now, with that being said, it does take skill to make a poor quality garment because the quality might be poor as in the fabric, but the construction can still be substantial because these garments need to hold up through daily work in fields. Now, the owners of these plantations, they might not, they don't care about how fancy they look unless they're in Charleston with their livery and their fancy servants who wear these outrageous outfits. But out here, sort of not the back country because that's moved way out west by this point, but in rural South Carolina, it doesn't matter how poor they look as long as they get the job done. Now let's look at the skill of tailoring that these enslaved seamstresses and tailors would have had to have in order to actually construct garments and make them. Now on the table in front of me here, we have a men's vest and the collar and pocket flaps of a men's coat, which are gonna look into the more detail about how those are actually made and sort of the binding and the stitching involved. Now when we look at this collar, you're gonna see a lot of sort of cross stitching going back and forth and back and forth. Now, that doesn't look like it's doing anything, but when you actually look inside of the collar itself, if that can be seen, you're gonna see a bunch of back stitches or basting stitches holding this interfacing in place. Now, what that interfacing does, is actually gonna stiffen that collar so that if you sort of hold it, it doesn't flop down all the way. Now, historically in the 19th century, you're gonna see sort of the rise of all the top stitching. Now, all that top stitching means is they're stitching on the very edge of the fabric on that seam. Now today you can even see this on modern garments, such as suit jackets and some more, some jeans occasionally you'll see top stitching on the edge of your seams. That's just to help give that a nice sturdy reinforcement to hold that together. That's all that's for. But that does take skill to construct because you wanna make sure your stitching is not really wide, really narrow. You wanna have a nice even stitching all the way around. And once that's all completed, you can assemble it into a garment that's very similar to the coat I'm wearing now, although you can make it single-breasted, double-breasted, open like this, or you could close it. There's a lot of variation you can do. Now these skilled and slave seamstresses and tailors, they would know how to make them wear on the body properly and be constructed well if they're making it for the household itself. Hi, I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm the Preservation Specialist at Historic Bratonsville. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about some of the um, restoration work that we've done on our original slave buildings here. So we are recently been restoring and almost come to the completion of the restoration of our original slave house in Derry. The slave house is the building that you can see in the background here, and the Derry is the building that I'm standing beside right now. So just to give you a little bit of background on slave buildings here at Brattonsville, we know that in 1843, there were 139 people that were enslaved here at Brattonsville. According to the 1860 census, there were 80 people at that time, and those people were living inside of 20 slave houses here on the property. So the eight buildings that we can account for were all brick structures. And that is notable because um, at this time when these buildings were being built, brick was considered to be a finer building material than wood. It was um, expensive, it was thought of as being more durable. And at this time, the Brattons were building the homestead house out of wood. So we don't really know why they chose to build the slave buildings out of brick, but it was likely a show of their wealth and status. So this building here is the dairy. Um, we believe that this probably served a dual function. Um, it's interesting because this building has a basement. This is the only slave building that has a basement. Um, we believe that in that basement is where dairy products would have been stored and processed. So the basement um, provided a cool place. It also had ventilation windows um, that would have allowed cool air cross breezes to come through and to keep dairy products cold. So the ground floor, the main level of the dairy building, probably served as additional workspace for enslaved people and also housing. Um, we know that 1860, there were 80 enslaved people here living in 20 buildings. So that puts about an average of four people per building. 
Um, as you can see, this is a very small structure. It's about 300 square feet of floor space. So it's difficult to imagine four people crammed in this building and probably more earlier um, when there were more enslaved people living here. So we're very fortunate to still have these buildings standing, especially in the condition that they're in. They retain a whole lot of their original materials and integrity. Um, for example, the joists that you see here are hand-hewn. So when you look closely at them, you will see the tool marks from when they were actually shaped and cut using hand tools. So these were made before uh, lumber was being sawn at a mill um, in South Carolina and upstate. We also have the original window frames. Um, if you look at the window frames in each of the corners, you'll see that there is a, a peg. So these were held together with pegged mortise and tenon joinery rather than nails and screws. So that tells us that they are likely very old and probably original. We also believe these to be the original doors. These are board and batten doors, so they're very simple construction. They're made of vertical boards that are held together with horizontal battens. And once we removed these and removed some paint, we were able to clearly see that they had their original 19th century nails, as well as their hardware, their strap hinges and pintles. Now we're standing in front of the slave house. So the restoration of these buildings has occurred over a three-year period in multi-phases. The first phase was documentation. So documentation is really important for any preservation project to document the conditions of the building when you start the work. Um, in 2017, we had a summer preservation intern who meticulously measured photographed the buildings and created a set of measured drawings. In phase two the following year we did masonry restoration. So this included rebuilding some areas of deteriorated brickwork, um, cleaning the buildings, repointing. Repointing is the process of removing deteriorated mortar and replacing it with new mortar. And in doing that it's really important to match the original material. So we did analysis of the original mortar and we found that it was a mixture of lime and sand, also with added clay. We know that clay was an abundant material here, and it was probably added to extend the mortar, and it also lended this sort of orangey red color of this mortar. So we were able to recreate it by mixing in clay, as well as mixing different types of sands to replicate the original material. So one of the interesting features inside of the slave house is the presence of fingerprints in some of the bricks. And this is not uncommon in historic handmade bricks. It's due to the process in which the bricks were made. So bricks were made in molds. A brick maker would have packed clay and sand into the mold. Um, and then it would have been emptied and allowed to dry for a period of time before it was fired in the kiln. It was during this drying process that if the bricks were handled too early or moved, the brick maker might have left fingerprints in the bricks. Uh, you might also find prints from animals, so deer hoofs or you know cat or dog paw prints. But this is a, just a particularly good example here of fingerprints in the bricks. We don't know whether the bricks were made here at historic Brattonsville. It's definitely a possibility because it was fairly common for bricks to be made at plantations, usually using enslaved labor to uh, produce bricks. We are actually doing some more research into that question currently. We've taken samples of bricks from the slave house, the dairy, and the two ruins of two original brick structures. We're having them an analyzed so that we can compare the chemistry and the mineralogy of the different bricks, try to determine whether they were all from the same source and possibly whether they were made at Brattonsville. So that would give us a lot more insight into interpreting these buildings. So phase three of the restoration has been restoration of woodwork. So that includes window frames, door frames, and the two original doors. So we have tried to save as much of that original material as possible. We do believe the windows to be original. We've also created new shutters. We used reproduction hardware for those shutters that was based on an original pintle that we found in the dairy. So the work is nearly complete. Um, this is the last of the slave house windows that we are currently working on, and we plan to reinstall that window sometime this summer. 
Another component of the slave house restoration has been the restoration of the interior finishes. We knew from paint analysis that this building originally had lime wash coatings. It was never painted with modern paint. So we chose to restore that lime wash finish. You can see it has a sort of translucent look. The brick kind of shines through in some places. We also restored the shake roofs on these two original buildings as well as the reproduction slave buildings. So we believe the roofs were originally made of shakes. We found evidence of that because there was an oak shake um, that we found in the attic level of this building. Um, traditionally, shakes would have been made by splitting pieces of wood off of a log by hand. So using hand tools, you'd end up with a hand split surface on both the top and the bottom. Current methods for creating these involve using a saw to saw the underside, um, whereas the top is typically hand split. But for this project, we used custom shakes that were hand split on both the top and the bottom, so that when you're standing in this space looking up, you're gonna see that hand split surface, which is more historically accurate. So this is one of the two original brick slave building ruins that we still have here. Um, in the background, you can see to the right is the dairy, and then to the left is one of the reconstruction buildings that was built on the foundation of the original building um, in the 1990s. We're very lucky at Brattonsville that we have these two original slave buildings and that they're in the condition that they're in. It's fairly uncommon to have slave buildings that are still standing on these rural plantations especially to have so much of their original building materials and building fabric intact. With these buildings, we really had very little in the way of documentation. The earliest images we had were from the 1960s or 70s. So when it comes to questions like what type of roofing did these buildings have? What did the shutters look like? What did the window grills in the dairy basement look like? We really have to rely on physical evidence and in some cases doing research of comparable buildings and making a decision based on that. It's really important to preserve enslaved spaces because they provide a physical record of the period of our country's history in which people were enslaved and forced to live and work on plantations. Uh, having a structure where you can stand and you know, be inside that building really helps to interpret and understand um, the lives of the people who were enslaved here.